Let's let's get started. Um, so Luis joined us here today. Um, he is basically a former lead at Carpre AI, who was back in the day the largest open source RLHF group, as per Luis's words. Uh, I know it's been a super impactful project, so so like I'm I'm very happy to have him here. Uh, he was also briefly a head of uh, language models at Stability AI, and he's a PhD student at Brown University. And other than that, I guess before this whole story, like I, I know you from the Ultra AI community, and like, and you were you were, you were setting the culture, and I think that that's that's mm -hmm. underappreciated uh, yeah. piece of knowledge that he invented the the the, the goose meme or, or yes, I, <laughs> the funk funk meme, which was very impactful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, have, I think I you can pick it up. The thing I've ever done, <laughs> literally, you can pick right. it up. All right, so who am I? Uh, so I've always kind of been interested in open source. Um, you know, in uh, in high school, I wanted to be a novelist, and and uh, I I tried it a little bit, and I, I realized I, I don't actually enjoy the writing process, but I enjoy the world building process. And this was back in 2012 when uh, AI was like. Theano, ImageNet, and convolutional neural networks, and no one really knew how to do like uh, neural language models yet. Uh, so I, I was trying to get into ML back in, back then, and trying to learn like how do I actually create language models? I write stories. How do I how do I create um, how do I build story worlds using AI? And um, I hedged my bets, perhaps incorrectly. I hedged my bets, thinking that like neuroscience uh, might give us the path forward uh, to to doing this. And I quickly realized that in neuroscience, you have to work with mice, which is not particularly fun. It's not for everyone. Maybe some people like it, but I, I certainly did it. And uh, after a brief stint with neuroscience, I joined O3I in the beginning of uh, 2020, basically right when they formed, right when COVID was starting. And I uh, basically ended up running their, uh, um, oh, sorry, that's what's the U3. I, I basically ended up running their preference learning group. And I, I got really interested in um, understanding human preferences and understanding uh, the ways human preferences interacted with storytelling and how do you prefer one kind of character archetype over another? And what does it mean for like, stories to be coherent from one person's perspective versus coherent from another person's perspective and there was all of this intermingling between uh where language models were at the time which was like gpt3 um 175 billion giant uh language models that were still really shitty and uh all of this idea of all these ideas behind like generative ai content so generating stories generating novels and and building these very detailed story worlds and uh i worked on a on a project called carp so contrastive author author slash reviewer pre-training uh and initially it was me Shab uh shablin matania matania i never used to pronounce his last name sorry um and ryan tehan uh we worked on this paper called Cut the Carp, uh, Fishing for Zero Shot Story Evaluation. And the idea was that if you scraped this giant data set of like critiques on stories and uh, stories themselves, and they were all aligned pairs, you could in turn train like a clip-like model to represent embeddings between these uh, two spaces and say, oh, if you have a high cosine similarity, with a critique that says the story is incoherent, then you know that the story is is in some way in that span incoherent, and that can act as like a surrogate for like a preference. We actually found that uh, these CARP models had incredibly strong correlation with human preferences, significantly stronger than like state of the art language models at the time, which would have been GPTJ, I think. Yeah. I think soda would have been GPTJ. So we we had way stronger uh, correlation with preferences than GPTJ, and um, it, it really paved the path forward for like thinking about how can we actually represent this like feedback component. How can we represent um, the mechanisms by which um, like these models 
represent feedback and, and use that to our benefit for preference learning or, 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 or for RL. And someone asked a question, but I can't. Yeah, just a quick quick question. Like, when, when did the project get started? I don't remember. I think it would have been like early 2021. Uh, when did GPTJ come out? I think somewhere it, around that period, but not sure I can Google it. Yeah, it would have been right around then um, because Clip had just come out, I think. Yeah, or, July, July 2021 is when GPTJ was announced. Yeah, and we had had it internally at Eleuther for about a month and a half, I think, before that. Nice. Yeah. Nice. But anyways, uh, well, I'm already because I already interrupted you. Just just to to ask you, are you are you fine with people raising hands and then I can interrupt you for them for them to ask questions, or you prefer to just have a no 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 in, 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 interrupt interrupt. There there's awesome. there's only there's only a few slides here, and then, then we're going to kind of freehand it, and I assume it's going to be a lot of back and forth. Sounds so, good. Awesome. Um, but yeah, this this was the founding team of Carper. Um, we, we, we had established a research direction, which was the idea of like using critiques and feedback uh, as preference data, and then using that to, to bootstrap some kind of personalization process. We weren't really interested in RLHF. We were interested in like having story models or having code models that would produce code of a certain style or stories of a certain style. And then how can you interpolate between these? It's kind of similar to um, like recent methods, like personalized soup, but this was um, pre all of the RLHF and pre being able to like do any of the stuff that personalized soup does with like GPT-4. Um, but yeah, uh, back in early 2022, we saw uh, RLHF as, as a potential way to personalize models. Um, just going off of like, I think the instruct, no, what, what paper had just come out? The Anthropic HHH paper had just come out, I think like a few days before we had started TRLX. Um, we, no, it came out after, it came out a few days after we had started TRLX. So I guess the date here is wrong. It would have been December, 2021. Um, and there was no real open source infrastructure for doing ROHF at scale. There was no real way to, to systematically uh, make your models more preferred or less preferred. There was one library by Leandro at Hugging Face called TRL, and uh, TRLX was initially just made as a fork of TRL, uh, and we were going to upstream it back to TRL once it was in a position where you could RLHF models that were the size of GPT-3. That was always our objective in the beginning. And, and um, I think that we actually achieved that objective sometime last spring. But, um, you know, we were just going to add very scale, uh, we were just going to add scalability features to TRL and kind of call it a day. But it, it evolved into this own project and its own team with its own research agenda and all the cool little nuances of Carper and, and at, at a point it stopped making sense to really upstream it back to TRL and it made more sense for us to um, kind of turn it into its own thing. And, you know, going back to what I was saying before, we had this other project called Project Gyarados and the idea was that you could break down a preference into multiple kinds of feedback and you could use those multiple kinds of feedback to train different reward models, different personalization agents and all these different personalization agents could be used to personalize the a, a story generating model to whatever user preferences a particular user at some time had. Uh, once again, the technology wasn't really there to support this and it kind of just died when um, we needed to focus more on ROHF infrastructure. So Harper remained relatively unknown until October of 2022 when we released TRLX. Um, we were aqua hired by stability, I think, in like June of 2022. I don't remember exact dates, but at that point we became part of the like stability family. The stability was like getting a bunch of like large open source groups to to join their umbrella. Um, it was really great for us at the time. 
all these people who are like just basement hackers working on random open source projects now could do this as their full-time job and and could build things that were really deeply fascinating to them um it it also let us really really grow um the the carper team and and really grow where we were going with carper and 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 uh, our objectives and our goals uh we even announced things like open instruct which uh oh no i'm not allowed to talk about what that turned into okay um <laughs> someone at civility may say what open instruct turned into at some point uh i know i'm not allowed to say that um but we we had really big lofty ambitions and these big lofty ambitions uh were really what 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 propelled us to to like the forefront of open source rlhf um so when the library came out we got like 2000 stars it was really cool it was really fascinating the community grew a little bit and then like three weeks later at nurips 2022 chat gpt drops and OpenAI puts out this blog post that talks about rohf and then we did this huge huge pr push uh at harper where we we put out a ton of stuff about rohf and you know we kind of just boosted our popularity into the stratosphere we got over like ten thousand followers on twitter we 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 got four thousand stars on our github repository uh we started getting interviews from like random media outlets we started like uh getting uh talks from like really high uh high profile famous researchers um sergey Le uh, levine's talk at carper was like one of my favorites i still go back to watch it occasionally it, all of our talks are available on our youtube channel if people are curious um but we needed to sustain this growth and that that was proving to be very difficult um and we get yeah, oh sorry yeah quick question um while we are all here um you mentioned the Agri hire like when you when you say Agri hire do you do you mean like did, did stability AI literally give you stocks in the in the like were you a company back then or how did the Agri hire work or they just like employed you we they just employed us we we were just a bunch of like basement hackers who were like working on our free time um we were getting gps from a luther ai but we weren't like an a company we 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 were just um bunch of uh, friends who were working together on some cool projects got it got it yeah so and maybe a um, question like what do you what do you think you, you briefly described it right now but like do, do you think how much was like luck at play versus you guys had a like a process of, of how to, to make how to grow the open source community like obviously you guys had experience from military eye before and all of that but like how much was it hard work in building the community versus just being there at the right time in the right space, like RLHF being the, the ingredient, the missing ingredient that the made I, the, the I, I really don't think it was luck. Um, like that, it was the, the third open source community that I've built and um, that I've helped build and, you know, someone's going to be like third oh lewis i thought you only did a luther and and carper and and my response would be yeah the 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 third because no one knows about the first community i ever helped build um, because it was so deeply unpopular um but um i've learned a lot of lessons and most people who get lucky get lucky on their like their first time really like you're not like by the time you're at, at your third time you have a lot of experience and, and and you know how to build these communities and you know how to get people excited and you know like what the community actually wants to see and by the time you get to there you can pretty reliably build communities and it it, it turns more into a science than it does like like a praying that you get lucky situation Make sure, make um, sure. I, I meant more like, of, of course, like it, I didn't, I didn't imply that the luck was the, 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 the main feature, but like it, it definitely seems that a lot of companies did benefit from the, from the explosion of, of ChatGPT and that kind of like exploded many of the communities, just boosted them up. Yeah. In that, in that um, sense. I'm not entirely sure though. Like, I feel like 
there's a lot of communities and a lot of projects that got that initial boost from chat gpt and then kind of fizzled out right and i think the fizzling out is kind of the communities that didn't know how to sustain open source or open science building and sustain those projects like what was that that agents library gpt agents or something or web agents or like um yeah there, was, there were a ton of explode like exploding github repos but I don't yeah know well like the them. really really big one that got bigger than torch it was like the most liked auto gpt auto gpt yeah dude that died so fast Did it? like it's i don't know anyone who even talks about it or uses it or does anything with it like i look at the repository and it's it's all people who like don't know what a language model is making issues and 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 it's like i just like you know it's not to throw shade or anything but like there's there's definitely a skill barrier in in building successful open source communities that attract the right kind of talent to keep them uh, alive and if you fail that task early on the community dies very quickly no matter how how lucky you get yep i agree what what would you because you mentioned it's now more of a science like what would you say are the main features or like what's what are the cooking steps for for creating a successful or you have that maybe on the next slide i don't want to keep you no curious. no that, that that's this slide that's this slide and i was actually um uh, this side is so brief that I, I was actually expecting like questions like that, uh, which is perfect. Um, so the most successful, the most important thing that you can really do is keep the community involved and keep shipping things. And I know it sounds stupid, but we ship something every week at Carper and we did this for three months straight and our engineers were exhausted but it's really just the required part of the process in order to keep the community alive. And, you know, you ship things, you ship things, you ship things, and then you build community working groups around the things that you ship. If you are shipping, I don't know, a new ROHF data pipeline, you should be building working groups that use that data pipeline for research or for projects or for hackathons or anything in order to get the community excited about your features and about where you're going next the other thing is that in building these communities you really can't have any self of shame the sense of shame you have to be as loud as you can and you have to be obnoxious as you can and you need you not not like astroturf but you you just need to be able to get in people's face who would want to use your tools uh, but don't know you exist or, or don't know about your thriving community or don't know how they can get involved in your community. That, that, that's, that's such an important thing. You have to be loud and obnoxious about how easy it is to get involved in your community, about how easy it is to ramp up. Some things that, that we did is we, we hosted weekly talks uh, that were like from very popular papers at the time. And we had everyone come to the talk our talks often got 30 to 50 people it was really nice and at the end of our talks we would always bring up how this could be done in working groups or how this could be involved in working groups or involved in the community and so many of our most popular and most successful working groups were actually the result of these talks there's there's so many papers and projects that came out of carper ai um that are 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 so deeply successful and 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 um really making strides what was his name enrico uh Schippel? Schippel? i never know his last name he um started a lot of his open source efforts like all of the like llama extension stuff at corporate ai using corporate ai compute and those projects have been so deeply successful and i might be wrong i think that was literally in response to some of the talks that were given at, at, at carper Awesome. We actually had Enrico a couple of weeks ago. They gave a mm -hmm. talk on, on Yarn, and they just had a couple of hours ago, I think, they released the uh, Mistral 7B uh, yeah. Yarn Yarn version, version 2. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Enrico's great. I, I loved working with him. Um, every once in a while, I, I chat with him. I still want to work with him some more, but our, our schedules have never really matched up.
So yeah, we we got to the point where we were competing with like DeepMind, OpenAI, uh, Cohere, Character AI for like recruits. Um, and I feel like once you get to that point, um, a mistake that I made is that I got too involved in trying to get the best recruits possible. Whereas I kind of let the community slide a little bit and it kind of avalanched to the point where by the time I left Harper, we didn't have any active working groups. The talks had stopped um, and there were a number of other little downfalls that had happened. And it, it really, you know, once you build the community, you can't stop focusing on the community. You can't just step away for like a month because it does die very quickly. I know, but the, the, the trick is, at least in my experience, like I, I made the same mistake with this server, by the way. And then like we revived it with these talks so over the past months, like I, I think we started in, in summer, maybe in June, like we mm -hmm. revived it with, with fairly recurring talks and and like the, the community has never been more vibrant. Mm -hmm. So like, I do think if you ever build those muscles and if you have the people who are like the, the right people, in the sense like they're they're passionate about those topics you can still revive it but i, I agree like it's, it's it's much easier to just keep on the inertia going once you have yeah. that that's the snowball rolling just just keep it going 100 mm -hmm. yeah. talking about this one more quick question um you you, you mentioned the, the 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 you have to have this shameless promotion i, I completely understood what you said they are like sometimes it's cringe you're cringed yourself but you do it because like it's ultimately what you need to do and like mm -hmm. maybe if you can share like what were some of the what, what were some of the channels you used to to share the the carpet work? Oh, I would I would message or email or text very famous people on Twitter and ask for retweets. <laughs> um, nice. <laughs> I've never done that honestly. Yeah, <laughs> I I became pretty close friends with some with some of them. I remember it got to the point where like Gary Marcus and I would exchange photos of geese. Well, I know, I know. Why Gary? No, man. Why did you go to the dark side? <laughs> <laughs> but it was um, building a community really is being about as shameless as possible. Actually, I should catch up with Gary. I haven't spoken with him in a very long time. Um, but like, you know, it's not like, like you're just using these people for their following. You, you don't just go for anyone. You have to go for people that you think you, you'll be friends with or you think that you have a mutual interest with and, and you build from there. Don't, 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 don't be like, like a snake that like just uses people. You, you have to like, you know, you got to put in the effort. I agree. I always tell people like the, the, the best way, especially like a lot of people like me dm me to just refer them for for deep mind or whatnot and i always tell them like the best thing you can do is first try and help that 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 human being by like mm -hmm. either contributing to their open source project or whatever like be, being useful before you ask something in return yeah, or, you know, yeah. like it's also fine to ask something in return straight ahead as long as you as you said you're playing a like a recurring game with that with that person you're mm -hmm. not just exploiting them for for like a single person yeah B building your network is is genuinely one of the most important things that you can do like even if you're just building an open source community honestly meeting vcs and having vcs help you build your network is 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 is, is important and and some of the earliest connections that i got back in my career was from like an angel investor friend that i had right when this was this would have been back in like 2020 and and like everything kind of just started there honestly really you can't understate building your network 100 percent agree with this there, there mm -hmm. was a ton of opportunities that opened up for me personally just because i, I hear yeah. people and and then like i made myself useful to the community and and like so i 100 mm -hmm. agree, agree with what you're saying mm -hmm. yeah okay Okay, so what other research areas did we focus on when I was there? Um, Open-endedness, the idea of like using evolution to generate uh, synthetic data. We put out Open Elm, which was like before all the like Evo instructor Evo prompt papers came out, and it was like the first 
large scale infrastructure for doing evolutionary search for synthetic data. Um, it still produces by far some of the best synthetic data that I've ever seen. <laughs> it's it, it's it's really really good. Um, I still think that evolutionary learning is is the way forward for synthetic data, even though many people seem to not agree. Um, we also worked on code models. One of the early like things that we wanted to do with with Carpa was have like dialogue agents that control smart devices around your house because we thought that that was really cool and that um it would really let us show off benefits of rlhf we could do like here's a smart age here's a smart agent uh without rlhf and here's one with rlhf notice that the one without rlhf turns your oven on to 450 and tries to kill you like there's a lot of really interesting things that we could show that, that that really presses the need for good RLHF right now, right? And it it was it was um, really fascinating. And and the code team is basically all that's left of Carper at this point. <laughs> um, almost everyone else is left. Um, but uh, they're 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 still going. They put out stable code and. Uh, I should catch up with them. I don't know what they're working on now, but uh, I assume it's pretty good because stable code was a pretty awesome model. Um, and we worked on dialogue agents. We worked on dialogue agents long before chat GPT. I guess we kind of started around like when Blenderbot 3 came out and was like the first like open RLHF chatbot. Um, Blenderbot 3 was really, really bad. And I don't think it was the fault of Blenderbot. I think it was the issue of... Uh, of the base model OPT being really bad. Um, but it was a good first attempt into RLHF agents. And I think it kind of readied the space for um, readied the space for ChatGPT. Because when BlenderBot 3 came out, a bunch of other organizations besides Carper started working on their own RLHF infrastructure. I think AI2 did something, University of Washington did something, and then we did something as well. And it was kind of just a race to see who could get out, get theirs out first. And, um, we actually, we, we beat AI2 by about 30 minutes. <laughs> um, so I'm so very proud of that. <laughs> Even though it was, we probably... <laughs> I know, it was so funny. Um, but... Um, but we beat them by 30 minutes and on release day, both of our libraries were buggy messes and it was awful and neither of them were usable whatsoever. Um, so not only did we race for the completion, we raced for, uh, uh, for which one could actually get the, the, the finished ROHF library done the fastest. Nice. And then we ha had multiple failed attempts of ROAIF early on um, we had the first ROAIF project, which was Cut the Carp, um, but we fell behind the curve. Uh, I know that when we started Cut the Carp, OpenAI was just getting started in ROAIF, and we beat them, I think, by like a few months, almost. Um, but at the same time... Uh, we didn't draw the connection as well from critiques and revisions to RLHF that, that they did. And because of that, we over-invested in human feedback, whereas we should have invested from AI feedback from the very beginning. Using these um, models back in the day, when was the, this project started? Cut the Carp would have been started July 2021 or June 2021 or something like that. So, 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 so back then using like an LLM as a judge was not, I mean, it was not as as widespread. It was no, I don't think anyone was doing it. I think AI Dungeon was like the only one who was actually doing it, which is really funny. Yeah. Interesting. What happened with them, by the way? Maybe a tangential question, if you if you know. I, I know they were very, very, very popular at one point of time and it felt like a fidget spinner. You just had a I spike think... and then they disappeared. I think novel AI basically ate, ate their entire audience. I don't think they really exist anymore. And I know that's probably a good person to get to get, to give a talk. Aaron, it's definitely worth reaching out to him. Kuru, um, the novel AI guy, or yeah, the novel AI guy. 
I he might be more in a position to answer that. I, actually, I worked for Novel AI for like a month or so. I was their chief scientist. Um, it didn't go particularly well, <laughs> but it was okay. It was a good learning experience. Nice. Maybe a quick question here on this slide. <clears throat> Why do you think CARP failed? You mentioned this dynamics with OpenAI, but like if you can elaborate maybe a bit more, what would you have done differently? Or maybe, yeah. We would have drawn the connection very early on to like of like revisions to RL data. And like I didn't fully realize that until the constitution. No, I shouldn't say that. I realized it about a month before the constitutional AI paper came out. And at that point I was a little late to the party. Um I think if we had seen the writing on the wall earlier about revisions and really grasped what they were going to do, um, we would have been in a better position. And I still think most of the industry is sleeping on ROAIF. I think that no one really, unless you're deep in the weeds in ROHF, understands how important revisions are about to be. Revisions are going to be like the next big thing um, and everyone's going to be creating the best revision data set that they can and everyone's going to be working on ROAIF and like there's going to be pre-training corpa that are like that are just revisions and just critiques and can it's, you clarify it's, what do you mean by 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 um what did you say Re reviews or revisions what, what do you mean exactly so when you have like a text a snippet of text you prompt the language model to provide a critique. So just a plan of like what's wrong with the text and how to improve it. And then you ask it to revise, which is just like rewrite the text to like remove everything bad about it. So if you have something unsafe, you, you have the critique, write what's unsafe about it. And then you have the revision, take the critique in the original text and rewrite the text to be safe. Got it, makes sense. And it, it really is, it's so powerful. Like you can do revisions for anything literally anything you like i i've seen people use revisions and critiques for playing chess and like go and that's that's mind-boggling that that like this idea from language models is, is so widely reapplicable that it just works in whatever domain you throw it at and like everyone's fucking sleeping on it everyone's sleeping on it it's crazy anyway Oh, that's it. That's it for the slides. There's no more. I, I have one more question here. Um, yep. I'm going to stop sharing and I will have questions. Sounds good. Why do you think, why do you think like we as a field waited for so long for, for chat GPT to become popular? I mean, maybe, maybe this combination of LLM plus RLHF, why didn't it become a widely spread idea? much sooner like even even maybe a late 2020 or 2021 because to the best of my recall you just mentioned this this blender bot but like i don't remember seeing that any 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 anything on twitter really that 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 spiked up my attention or that, that went it, viral like, it wasn't in the, it wasn't in the hype cycles that, that that that's the only answer that i have but like okay hype cycle one thing but like uh, th there is obviously benefits for consumers like if nothing else people would have noticed okay this is much better and like that would have spread out oh, like across twitter if you know what i mean it doesn't have to in that sense i'm a bit confused why 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 did we have to wait so long it, it was it was loudly being talked about you just had to be in certain communities honestly like if you were in the communities that hung around like safety researchers or people in the rohf space or people in the like large language model space you heard about it very long before it ever reached twitter hype cycles but twitter is is often very far behind the curve discord server is being the the, the first mm -hmm. line of, of yeah <laughs> i mean honestly i i, I luther was talking about rohf since like day one like that was that was always something that interests them sense there, there's one question in the chat here um what is some advice slash learnings you guys have about motivating the team how do you maintain a horizontal quote unquote 
uh, horizontal organization, but at the same time have these deliverables weekly. Ownership over the project slash sub projects. How to motivate the team? What's the, what's the learning there as a team lead? I mean, really just have an overarching goal. Our overarching goal was open instruct. <laughs> And and everyone knows what that goal is, and everyone knows the big picture, and everyone knows all the steps to get there. And you have weekly syncs where you reiterate this goal and you reiterate the, the steps, and and everyone's all on the same page and everyone's happy. Like it's 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 just have a single narrative that you can push is is the answer to that. And then all of the working groups and sub projects need to branch off of the single narrative. Do you? put that obligation on, on that responsibility on, on like a single human, like a team lead, or do you make a process around that and like force like the, the upper so management or whatever to Harp, just build down Harper the message? I had a process where I would write the overarching like proposal document and the overarching narrative document. And then whenever someone wanted to do like a sub project or, or a side project or on a side, they'd write their own proposal document and they'd have to wind it into the overarching narrative document um and i you know it goes back to the storytelling background everything's got to be a story and everything has to feel like one cohesive narrative otherwise people will get lost and confused 100 percent agree there, there is something hardwired in human brain to just love stories mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, storytelling mm -hmm. and that's like every single presentation like on youtube where people are trying to tell you how to how do you capture the attention whatever it's always like storytelling it's all it's always, yeah, the same it's, thing. always it's always storytelling like, like, like it, it comes up everywhere true true like even then, even the even the presentation i just gave it was it was a, it was a history of of carper and it was told as a history and and the fact that it was told as a history kept the discussion engaging yeah i agree i, I think that contextual bit is missing like in, in a lot of modern education especially like in like elementary and high school, it completely lacks. Like the way we were taught mathematics, it's like completely stripped apart from the from the original historical context. Who were these mm -hmm. figures? Who were these people? Who built this? And then that kind of gives you the confidence that okay, those were some human beings. I can do this as well. So from that standpoint, it's also useful. Mm -hmm. um, David had a question here in the chat. David, you want to ask the question yourself, or you want me to read it out? I can read it. Might be unrelated but here it goes did you ever build anything to verbalize conclusions about user label type otherwise asking as someone applying ai in psych neuroscience education did you ever build did you ever i'm not sure i understand that builds a system to con verbalize conclusions about user yeah i'm not sure do you... No, I mean, we've, we've tried inverse RL, which is we take information about the user and then we try to figure out what kind of critic they would have been. That is something that we tried. It worked pretty well. Um, like we would take like someone's browsing history or like their interaction history on like a number of websites and we just throw everything into a big prompt. Um, hey, David, I hope this answers your question. Um, maybe one question for me. Um, you, you mentioned that you're bullish on, on, on RL uh, AIF. I'm, I'm not only bullish, I think that RL HF is going to die very soon. I don't, I don't, I don't think yeah. that people are going to use human feedback anymore at some point. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, we had the same dynamics with going from supervised to unsupervised learning. It's, it's, it's been a similar trend. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in that respect in previous paradigm shifts as well but like going forward over the next couple of years like where, what what do you see what else do you see as like interesting lines of research or interesting lines of that that will eventually lead to something that's like interesting for, from the commercial standpoint honestly and i know this is such like a bullshit answer it's got to be retrieval it's got to be retrieval everyone says retrieval every year and then it never happens no one knows how to make retrieval work <laughs> like i'm i'm convinced no one knows how to make retrieval work at all do, do you think that rag currently is going to disappear in, in two years time i don't know dude I, I i i someone has to solve retrieval and that someone has to be much smarter than me <laughs> I, I i don't know how to do it i i, I really don't know 
And I think it's such a hard and complicated problem that it's I the moment someone fix gets retrieval working, it's going to be as big as as the release of GPT three. It's gonna be huge. It's it's gonna be like world changing and 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 like it's gonna be absolutely insane. But no one knows how to take those steps. No one knows how to get there. And and people have been trying now for a little under a decade. And and it, it, it's crazy because we're just not making any progress. Do you consider the neural Turing machines from Alex Graves as the early work along those lines? Or would you? Yeah, would you that, that, that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of the earliest work that I was kind of thinking of there. Yeah. How do you think theoretically we can scale it up? Like, did you imagine like the the, the agent going to like Google search index and then like taking it, like snapshots and doing soft attention or what's your thinking? I really don't know. Data ingestion is like such a big problem for retrieval that like I don't know if even someone the size of Google can solve how to do proper data ingest ingestion. Like uh, how, after how many billions of dollars they've invested in the problem, I don't know if they can improve it. To clarify, do we want data to contain their vision themselves or data of their critiques, answers that have been revised? We want the whole pipeline. You want you want the original, you want the critique, you want the revision, you want everything because everything is useful for our AI. The, the, the critique can be viewed as like chain of thought for the reward model. The revision is like the preferred answer and the original is like the not preferred answer. And like in the original constitutional AI, they do the separate step where they fine tune on the revisions. That is completely stupid. It's not required. You never need it. I don't know why they did that. I re-implemented the constitutional AI with and without that and there was no performance difference whatsoever. Nice. Um, okay, I think he has a follow-up question. Do you think that sometimes future people will train language model augmented agents for the uh, can and also contribute or scale? Maybe it'd be easier, Joe, if you can ask a question because people will be watching this postcard on, on YouTube or I can read it out loud. Easier to just jump and ask a question yourself. Mm -hmm. So, do do you think that in some time in the future, people will train general LLM augmented agents, where the LLMs could allow for flexible observation, action specifications based on the context, and also contribute to reasoning what to do in a similar fashion to OpenAI's five large system, large scale uh, self uh, play system, perhaps for tasks like executing programming projects fully autonomously. Or so there is uh, a blog post that came out. So I, I actually I have my own um, open new open science group called New England Arledge of Hackers. Um, it's really cool, but it's it's all in person in the New England area. Um, there's a Discord. Anyway, um, there's a thing here for synthetic preference data using Monte Carlo tree search, where you basically do self play rollouts over like tree of thought stuff in order to generate like high quality synthetic data. And then you do iterative refinement via like a rest based approach. Um, and I, that's really like, I feel like self play for ROHF is something that we can do now. I don't think it's a futuristic thing. In fact, it would blow my mind if like OpenAI and DeepMind aren't already doing that and have been doing that for a year because it's so easy to implement and it's so easy to get working. Like language model self-play is like something people have been thinking about since like GPT-3. Agreed. Can't say, can't say more what I've seen, but... <laughs> No, I've, I mean, I've, it's, it's, I've, it's obvious at this point in time that yeah, I've, I've I've seen a lot. I, I I'm not under NDA. I've seen a lot, and I know for a fact that people are doing Monte Carlo tree search with tree of thought, and that's being fed into RL pipelines. And I, I'm not going to say who's doing that, but definitely uh, some some large AI company is doing that. A lot of money. 
mm -hmm. with a lot of money. <laughs> because like, as soon as you start, like the, the, the thing with a lot of those, all the work is that as soon as you try to do real time, like stuff with, with, with agents, if you try to do that on the fly, like something like, like a uh, tree of thought or whatnot, it takes just too many calls. It's so slow. It doesn't work, but offline, of course, to, to, to train the model, if you have money, if you have the infrastructure completely mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah. It's a trade off as always, right? Yeah. How much do you it, offload to training stage versus the inference stage? Where do you want to put the burden? I and you know I'm I'm I've been very bullish on offline RL for such a long time, but like, man, REST is so good. It's so good. <laughs> um, I, I I'm willing to do online RL if it just means I have to do REST. Um, I am not willing to do DPO, and I'm not willing to do um uh, muesli or ppo but i'm willing to do rest god i, I M M muesli um is apparently very good um and no one's been able to replicate it outside of deep mind and it's always been very upsetting how do you how do you spell that one muesli or you mean like mu zero or like what are you referring to um muesli uh muesli is uh, mu zero without Monte Carlo research and it beats and it beats mu zero and it's deeply fascinating and I've been waiting for literally anyone to get it working outside of deep mind and no one's been able to do it yet the closest people have been able to get is like Impala and even getting Impala working is a nightmare and Impala is also from deep mind right Impala is also from deep mind yes yeah DeepMind is like this weird concoction of like a bunch of really, really, really good RL research researchers who have no communication skills whatsoever. And it's 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 like they're so good, but they're so bad at explaining what it is that they're yeah, doing. Yeah. The worst thing is even when you're inside of the company, like it's it's really hard to to like check, unless you're a part of that team. Like oh my god, I've I've heard horror stories. I've heard horror stories of like people being on like an RL adjacent team and they're just told to clone the repository, run it, and don't ask questions. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Awesome. Louis, this was this was a pleasure. Mm -hmm. uh, unless people Fine. don't have any 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 other questions, I think we can slowly wrap it up. Mm -hmm. I think I answered everything. I definitely yeah. answered Wending Lee's uh, question, which was, what are you doing next? And I'm doing a Luther and my open science group, uh, New England ROHF Hackers. I'm going to share that link in the in the server mm -hmm. so people can see it. Awesome, Luis. Thanks for joining. No problem. See you.